Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Night Science Talks with LumCon. We're so happy that you could join us this evening for yet another amazing science talk. Um, I will have to extend apologies to you guys, a lot of apologies to you guys probably, about, uh, about tonight's science talks. Unfortunately, Dr. McLean is unable to join us tonight. Um, we are in the end stages of hurricane prep at the Marine Center. Um, we're preparing for Cristobal, um, who is supposed to make landfall sometime Sunday, I guess is the latest update, maybe Monday, who knows. Um, but we will be prepared um, by tomorrow afternoon at the Marine Center. So um, we'll send updates and everything about that whole process on our social media. So if you want to watch the Marine Center in almost, almost real time, uh, we'll be sending a lot of updates through our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So keep in touch this weekend if you want to see what that looks like. <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie says hello. Hello, Dr. Miller. Which Stephanie? Uh, Kling. Stephanie Archer? Or Kling. Kling. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, Stephanie Archer is out there somewhere. Yes, she is. <laughs> we'll probably hear from her in a second. <laughs> Sam is saying the Dr. Miller fan club is reporting in for duty. <laughs> That's <laughs> great to hear, Sam. You're in here somewhere. You're in one of these PowerPoints. <laughs> It's all coming in. There's Stephanie Archer. Dr. Archer. <laughs> Good to have you tonight. <laughs> oh, Brenda says hello from your fellow sponge hunter. <laughs> Who is that? Uh, that was Brenda. Ah, uh, yes. She's from mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Yep. It's my Tulsa hey, friend. Hey, Ross. How are you doing? Great. You have a lot of well-wishers, very excited fan club out there uh, sending in their greetings. So we can skip the really annoying question I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at the seven o'clock hour. Um, I will begin with a introduction of Dr. Miller. So bear with me as I read a prepared bio. <laughs> Don't mess up now. <laughs> Sorry, tonight's broadcast is really crazy, you guys. <laughs> All right, serious Mert. Dr. <laughs> Miller earned her bachelor's of science and her master's of science from Southeastern Louisiana University with a focus in microbiology and an emphasis in anaerobic bacteria. She continued her education from there to earn her doctorate of education that she has used to build research in the classroom, both nationally and internationally. Kudos to you, Dr. Miller. Within the past six years, she has presented research in the classroom pedagogy at 12 conferences and has twice been the guest lecturer for the Microbiology Society in the UK. Good on you. Uh, she is an associate professor of biology and director of the Baton Rouge Community College STEM Science Research Program. Yay! Mm -hmm. Applause out there. Um, besides her work with freshwater sponges, she is also working on biodegregation study with assistant professor, Dr. Barty at LSU, and is leading, a student, is leading student research projects to find new antimicrobial agents in the environment to combat anti biotic resistance through the collaboration of the Tiny Earth Project. Welcome, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Mert. So is it my turn to start? Because I can't it see is. myself. <laughs> it is all you, lady. <laughs> so before I begin, I want to thank Mert and Craig and LumCon for hosting these events. I have sat in on almost all of them and they have been amazing. So I just want to thank LumCon first for inviting me to speak. And I hope that when I end today that you have some sort of passion or at least some, some inkling of what hunting for freshwater sponges is all about. So again, um, I'm Dr. Miller. I'm at Baton Rouge Community College. And Baton Rouge Community College is not a research institution such as LSU. 
we are a two-year institution where we focus mainly on teaching and I've been there for about um, I'm in my seventh I think seventh or eighth year and when I got to a Baptist community college I, I really wanted to help build research on the campus and through programs like Curry which I'll talk about in a few minutes uh, we've been able to do this within the classroom and to develop student internships so uh, with all my favorite presentations I always like to start with a poem and Shel Silverstein is one of my favorites I'm going to read this to you and it's, it's going to be kind of funny but um, it's about my hobby when you spit from the 25th 26th floor and it floats on the breeze to the ground does it fall upon hats or white Persian cats or on heads with a pity pat sound I used to think my life was a bore but I don't feel that way anymore as I count up the hits as I smile as I sit as I sit as I spit from the 26th floor now what does that have anything to do with me because some people question my hobby my hobby I have found is hunting for freshwater sponges and uh, it's, it's kind of been a long going joke between uh, my husband and my father-in-law of, uh, oh look, there's a sponge. And of course me, I'm gonna turn and look. Uh, <laughs> but I wanna share with you of how I got to this point of developing this love for freshwater sponges coming from the field of microbiology. Because where, you know, when, when you grow up in the microbiology field, it's all about prokaryotes. And, and I was just, it invested so much time into prokaryotes. And then there was an idea of this awesome eukaryotic organism. So I wanna start with a little bit of background and, and how we got to the point that, uh, of which we are. And then I'll talk about how we've implemented that at Baton Rouge Community College and how we're moving forward to process these sponges and identify these sponges. So in 2016, I was looking for other avenues to build research in the classroom. We had already worked with the Tiny Earth, which was mentioned in the introduction, and that was to build uh, a research component in the classroom based on antibiotic uh, properties of bacteria that may be found in the soil. But there was an idea that we could implement research in some of the earlier classrooms. So we started looking around for other opportunities, and one that I found was the Community College Research uh, Initiative, or CURRI. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Community College Undergraduate Research Initiative. <clears throat> and I, I sent an email, and the director of the program was Heather Bach. She still works with this, this program. And she, she reached out to me about some projects that they had going on. And one email changed my life. And it was this one specifically this part and it basically says on november 17th around noon we will be leaving finger lakes community college which is in rochester new york uh, in a large couple a couple large vehicles and it was basically to embark on a new england freshwater sponge collection and where do you think my mind went <laughs> well my mind was okay maybe i can study the bacteria in sponges no idea that, okay, I'm gonna love sponges more than the bacteria themselves. And then there was the thought of what are freshwater sponges? Because if you read the paragraph before, there was a workshop in Tulsa uh, the year before that, which I had not attended. One of my other colleagues, James Garten, he had attended this. So we were both invited on this excursion. And look at the date, November 21st, New England, cold. <laughs> and remember me south louisiana not acclimated to cold at all and i really didn't know what to expect move this i don't know what i'm doing okay there it is <laughs> so these were the new england states that we were to survey and we started out in Vermont and went through New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts. And uh, uh, 
it it was it was quite an adventure. So I want to share some of that adventure with you. But first of all, before we went on the adventure, I had some questions, like real questions. First of all, like what what it, what's a freshwater sponge? I had no idea what a freshwater sponge was. How are we going to collect these sponges? Were we going to be diving? Because diving in the freezing cold, that that never mind, I couldn't dive. And in the freezing cold, how are we even going to collect these? So I had all these concerns. What do freshwater sponges look like? Remember, I'm from the prokaryotic field. But I haven't studied the periphera except for my first biology class. That's all I knew about sponges. Did they look like this? That's that's what I was thinking of. Maybe they look like this. No clue. All I knew is we were getting in these two vehicles. We were driving around looking for something. So we went out and there was a group of us and, and the group was from uh, all over the United States. Uh, we have uh, Virginia, she is from Baltimore. We have Jim, he's from Rochester. We have uh, Darren, who's from Michigan. We've got Josh from North Carolina and Brenda, I know you're watching. She's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And James Garten, who also works with me at Baton Rouge Community College. We sat out on this five day adventure and it was freezing that's 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 i think that's besides the fact that i fell in love with sponges i think what i also remember is it was it was so freezing and i before i went out on the trip i called up my friend who who's from ohio and i told her i said how do i dress she said dress in layers so in this picture right here uh i could barely move i had so many layers on uh and we were breaking through ice to find these sponges and finally we didn't find any sponges in Vermont. When we got to New Hampshire, we've started to find sponges. And this, this right here on this glove, this is what we were looking for. Yeah, it didn't look anything like I had imagined. Why? Because freshwater sponges are so different from saltwater sponges. Sure, they have the same makeup as far as the filtration system. But when you look at them, you know, students ask me, what do they look like? You know what I tell them? They look like boogers and they don't believe me until they see them. Now, some of them don't. Some of them have a really nice carpet and they're, they're very large and I'll show you some of those. But a lot of them, like this one, that, uh, you know, that's, that's what it is. But these things are so powerful with filtration in, in the water system. They're super cool. Uh, here's some ice. We had to break through this ice to get to the rocks. Uh, it, was, it was just very cold. Uh, <laughs> At the end, we were very productive, though. We collected over 180 sponges uh, that we used at the next summer's uh, training institute that was held. So we were very productive. And the last couple days we weren't there, I did get to build a snowman, so that was cool. My, hold on. So these are freshwater sponges. Now, these are some freshwater sponges that we have found in Louisiana. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, they are from the phylum periphera. They're, uh, the freshwater sponges are in the class demo sponge, whereas compared to the marine sponges, the majority of marine spo sponges are found in cal uh, calcarea. And there are 31 defined species that have been documented in the United States. So when we're looking at sponges, again, we're talking about the background of sponges, how, how we took this knowledge and started to build it into the classroom. Um, there are two main parts that we study when we're looking at the sponge. We look at the sponge body, and the sponge body, depending on where you're reading about it in the literature, this can sometimes be referred to as a sponge carpet or the tissue, even though periphera uh, is known as being uh, no true tissue, sometimes people still refer to it as the tissue. So if you look at the top portion here, this would be referred to as the tissue or the sponge body. And this sponge body, it can be uh, defined as being more hispid or uh, hispid being uh, spiny or little hairs sticking up. And that's what gives it the sponge feel. And that hispid is the actual spicules, which I'll show you pictures of in a minute, okay? They may also have apparent osculums. 
So if I back up to this picture here, um, you can see the little holes. These are parent osculums. See, freshwater sponges are similar to marine sponges in that they are filter feeders. So they bring in water from the environment and they filter it up through the osculum. And when that when it goes through the filters, there are little flagella that beat and they absorb the nutrients. And this carpet can be different colors. Same species can be different colors. So this particular species in the same environment can be white. This one is green. A lot of times when it's the green color, uh, it has a symbiotic relationship with the algae, uh, cholera. And this is very dependent on the environmental factors. Uh, also, the other part of the sponge that we study are the gemmules. The gemmules are the dormant phase of the sponge. And you can see that right here. Uh, the, these are in a period of dipause or a, a, just a dormancy. And one way that we use this to identify the sponges is their arrangements. The arrangement of the sponge of the gemmules is very important. Both of these parts have spicules. And again, we'll look at what a spicule is in a minute. Now, sponges can be found in different water environments. When we were studying up north in the New England state, most of the water environments that we looked at were lodic environments. And lodic means the water is moving. Lodic, uh, the prefix lo stands for lotus, and lotus means to wash. And then lentic, uh, lentic water system is one that is stationary. In Louisiana, we have both. So we were able to find sponges that were in lotic and lentic environments, and then there are some sponges that are found in both types of environments. Uh, the pH and salinity, that, that it can vary between the sponge species. There are freshwater sponges that live in a higher salinity in a brackish area uh, where some, a little bit of salt can kill it. And the same thing with pH, you have some that will live at a pH of six, and then there's some that can live up to a pH of nine. Uh, a lot of times they prefer a shaded environment or a cooler environment. They do thrive in a lower temperature. And then there are some organisms that thrive in polluted environments. So for instance, E. fragilis, uh, Unapius fragilis. This organism, which is very abundant in Louisiana, uh, it thrives in polluted water systems. So we know that if we find a, one of these sponges in a water system, that without any doubt, that water system is polluted. And then there are some that really only thrive in clear water. Um, <clears throat> so here is a, a picture of False River. Uh, False River, uh, you may be familiar with it if you live in Louisiana. We, we did find sponges in this area and they have dropped the water uh, of, for about, about five feet. They, they lowered the water five feet and we revisited uh, about a, in March, I think it was in March, and a lot of the sponges that were there had died. So it was like visiting a sponge graveyard. It was very sad uh, and it's a disservice to the water system because those sponges are there to clean the water system. So we tried to put some of the rocks back into the water uh, to try and help filter it. Now, whether or not they're going to come back, we don't know. We're going to go check them out again. So the question was, when we got finished with, with uh, the freshwater sponge hunt in, in New England, and I learned all this stuff about uh, sponges, is could we find any of them in Louisiana? And there was one study, an extensive study, in 1969. That was the last study uh, that was performed uh, to do a, a survey, for instance, or per se, of freshwater sponges. There had been documentations or other publications about the specific freshwater sponges in the environment, but there had not been a complete survey since 1969. And it's very important that this is done so that we can communicate the health of these water systems. And right now it's not look at juice wolf. So we found a publication by Dr. now Dr. Michael Poyer. Uh, he is a uh, emeritus professor of UNO, and 
he did document the locations from which he had collected sponges. Unfortunately, there was not a GPS back then. There were no uh, coordinates for us to go back to and look. So we had to get creative uh, to try and find these spots again if, if we could access them. And then there were, you know, when you're looking at these uh, four miles east of such and such intersection. So uh, thankfully there's Google Maps because nothing else was working for us. <laughs> So after we had all the background and we knew where we would look, uh, we would look, we started to implement sponge hunting. And uh, this little section of the presentation is how we've implemented this in at, or at Baton Rouge Community College. So this is a snapshot, all of my, my uh, CSRO students watching here, here's a snapshot of some of you. And that's where we started. That's where uh, BRCC sponge hunting began. It was with the Citizen Science Research Organization of which myself and James Garden are the faculty mentors of. Uh, and this club is supported by the Student Government Association at BRCC. And we grouped together to find these locations. So the idea was we would find the locations, revisit them and see if sponges were there. Sounded great, right? No. <laughs> you can see this picture here. We were trying to get creative to, to, to line up the maps and line up the locations to see if we could find them. Uh, this is Ori working her magic with, with Google, uh, with the little Google Maps. Miss Linda, is, she's our lab coordinator trying to read the map. We, we weren't too swift with this. Uh, and the bad part is that we would, we would go to these areas and a lot of these areas, they were no longer accessible. Uh, and then there were some areas we would come to and uh, the water was too high. And then was when we, we, we got to False River. And there was a, a little sketchy area right here. And the guy on the dock, he said, I said, how, I said, how do we get down there? I said, if there are sponges in False River, if there are sponges anywhere in this area, they're down there. And he I said, how do we get down there? He says, ma'am, you don't wanna go down there. There's snakes. I said, you see this? And I point to my hoe. I said, I'm not scared of snakes. I said, I've got my boots on, I'm on a mission. And, and sure enough, we went, I think we saw a snake and that's not stopping me. We, we, we fought off snakes and some alligator throughout this whole journey. And sure enough, we found the sponge. So here, Here's, here I am holding up the first sponge of our sponge haunting adventure ever. Uh, so this started in 2018. And this was the group. This was the group who came with me. And Antoine, he saved our lives because we were getting attacked by ducks uh, or geese, I should say. We, we were walking up a hill and apparently there had been some eggs at the bottom. The geese weren't too happy. Uh, so we sent Antoine up first <laughs> because he was the tallest you know take one for the team Antoine he had the hoe on it and we were throwing water we all survived though fun fun times sponge hunting well that was great we had we we collected all these sponges but I was still missing a piece still missing uh, a piece of of how to move forward so uh summer training 2018 uh we went back up to Rochester we learn more about sponge morphology, how to hatch gemules. That's where we take the gemules and, and bring them back to life into a sponge. Uh, we learn how to do spicule prep, which I'll talk about in a minute, and how to do sponge barcoding where you look at the genetic information. So me and, and my good pal, Brenda and Josh, we were reunited and we were having a good time. So summer 2019, that's when we really ramped it up. And we decided that summer we had secured funding from a Department of Education grant and Capital One STEM grant, and we were on a mission. I had two research leads, Ori Roussel and Mike Hogan, and those two were chosen because Ori had a lot of research uh, behind her looking at for the sponges. She knew how to map, she knew how to find them. And then Mike, he knew all about PCR and molecular work because he had worked with me on another project. 
And then we selected interns and these interns were gold. I love my interns. They are the best, best interns I could ever hope for. And Jeffrey Tarver, he was one of my interns. He came in about mid mid midsummer because I needed someone else to go out in the field with me. And in summer, we led a huge excursion. We, we went all over Louisiana and we're going to show you a lot of snapshots from that. By the end of the summer, we had been very successful. We developed protocols for barcoding sponges, and that's doing the molecular work, the DNA portion of it. Uh, we had collected over 150 sponge samples. We had processed over 50 bottles of water. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, spicule preps were done for all of our samples, and we had contacted Dr. Poyer from that dissertation, and he now works with us and collaborates with us on this project. So we were very successful in the summer. Step three of implementation uh, for implementation was to put the research in the classroom. So in spring 2020, we put it in the classroom. I brought my whole biology two class out in the field. We collected sponges and we processed those sponges. So what is processing? I keep saying sponge processing over and over. So these next few slides go over the processing steps that we have done. You know, what does it take to take the sponge from the environment and identify it? First, my favorite part is the hunt. The hunt is, is very energetic. Uh, you, you have to be on your A game. You have to stay well hydrated. You have to be prepared to get down into the depth. Uh, you have to be prepared to get dirty. You're going to stink. Sorry. Uh, it, it's going to be a long day but that's how you, you find sponges. You turn over rocks, you turn over logs, you fall down, you get muddy, <laughs> uh, but you have a good time. That's my favorite part is the hunt. Frustrating part though is when you get to a site, you think, oh, there's gonna be sponges here and there aren't any sponges. And then there's the collection. Sometimes you gotta get into weird possessions to do these collections. Uh, you have to squat, you have to pr be prepared not to get your booty wet like Charmaine in the middle there. Uh, any little splash could come up and, and then you have to go change your clothes. Sometimes you got to hang upside down. Uh, but when we do the collections, uh, we always document the color, the shape, the size of the sponge, and we compare that to a conical tube. So in this first picture, I'm holding up a conical tube and that's labeled with the site and the sample from that area. Water collection, we take water collection from the sites. Uh, we do direct measurements at the sites, that's uh, pH, conductivity, and dissolved oxygen. And then the water is processed, we do a 14 point analysis, that's Quentin at the bottom. Uh, again, he processed 50 water bottles uh, over the summer and I'm so happy he's back on my team this, this summer to do some more water for us. Uh, that's my daughter in the middle. See, you bring your family out when you can't get your students out that day. Uh, she knows how to collect the water too. And then you, when you collect the, the you, you collect the sponge body and you collect the gemmules, you bring that back to the lab and you separate it out. So we use dissecting microscopes to separate that out. Uh, and it's put in different solutions depending on what you're planning to do with those samples. So this is Diamonique and Charmaine, they're separating out those samples. Spicule prep, this is where you break down the sponge body and the gemmules to get the spicule. And the spicule, spicules are for structure of the sponge. And uh, those are used in light microscopy and SEM, scanning electron microscopy. Uh, this prep we either do with bleach, and that's what we started doing with bleach, but sometimes bleach gives you a little dirty result. So now we're using nitric acid. While it's a little bit more dangerous, the preps come out a little clearer. So these are some light microscopy images of spicules. Uh, and so on the end here, this is a gemmule So a gemmule is a spicule that's found around the gemmule. A mega is one that is found within uh, the sponge body. Okay, so these are two examples of gemmule And each sponge has a different combination of these. So you can identify the sponge with these. 
Okay, next step, we have to do SEM processing because SEM tells or gives you a little bit more detail than your light microscopy. But SEM is very, very time consuming. To, to do a full prep takes three days and one day, and in one day it's about six hours. So it takes a lot of patience uh, because that sample has to be completely dried before it is brought to the scanning electron microscopy. When we do scanning electron microscopy, uh, it is sputter coated, which means there's a layer of gold that's put on, uh, and it gives us a higher magnification. So here, uh, uh, this is an arrangement of e fragilis. These are the gemules. You can see that they are connected together. So we use the scanning electron microscopy at the shared instrumentation facility at LSU. And I have to say, this was very exciting for me. Uh, I wasn't able in undergrad to learn and in graduate school to learn how to do scanning electron microscopy. So when I had the opportunity to learn how to do this at LSU, you know, I was ecstatic. Uh, so being, and now I'm gonna be honest with you, learning how to focus this SEM, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a game. Uh, this, is, this is Matthew, he has, uh, he has, he's got the prep down and he says the little gadgets on the electron microscopy are like the little Atari or the, the little kind of like a game, he says. <laughs> so we get really, really cool images with scanning electron microscopy. This is a birotule. So birotule, this is found in the Trochospongella latii. Uh, this is the surface of the gemule. So these again, are important to identify the sponge. Uh, without this, you could not say in a publication that this is Trochospongella latii. Uh, in a light, micros uh, light microscopy, it is not as defined. You don't get these details. So scanning electron microscopy is very important. Uh, this is, these are some more, uh, more images that I like that we do with SEM. Uh, uh, this is a cross section of a gemule and uh, I'm laughing because poor Matthew, cutting gemules is an art. And uh, we've looked at the apparatus to cut gemules and they, they cost a little bit too much for a, a uh, a knife if you ask me so we use blades and he's he's become a real pro at it and this is a slice of the gemule so you can see the layers within the gemule and again this is a way that you identify the sponge so this is spongella alba so we can see the outside of the gemule you can see the inside of the gemule and you can see the gemule scolaire this is the same gemule scolaire uh, that was in that light microscopy picture a few minutes ago. You can see there's a lot more detail. And then the last step is barcoding. Uh, so over that summer, Mike and I really worked to get the PCR down pat to uh, focus or choose the correct primers that focused in on the cytochrome oxidase gene that we were interested in. Uh, these PCR products, so if you don't know what a PCR does, uh, this stands for polymerase chain reaction. Uh, we take the sponge gemule, we extract the DNA from the gemule, and you have the whole piece of the DNA. We focus on one little section of the DNA, the cytochrome oxidase gene. And there's variation within that gene that can be used to barcode or to identify the sponge. Uh, so we PCR it up, which means to amplify. So we take one and we make millions of copies of this and we send it to Pennington Biomedical Research Center and they sequence it. They send us back the sequence, which is a combination of A, C, Cs and Gs. We edit the sequence through a program called Mega X. We construct phylogenetic trees and now we are at the process of depositing our sequences into the NCBI database. So the NCBI da database is a, a international database uh, in which you can find 
uh, like sponges. So where are we in our sponge in our sponge hunt? Well, I'm happy to say throughout this whole time, we have surveyed over 80 sites. Uh, this is our map of Louisiana. Everything highlighted in green, we have surveyed. Everything highlighted in yellow, we have surveyed, but we did not find sponges. And everything that has not been highlighted, that is on our to-do list. Why haven't we done it yet? Because last summer, this area was flooded. So that's on our to-do list now, fingers crossed. Uh, we have located 10 of the previous defined 15 Louisiana species, and these are the 10 that we have found so far. And to wrap up my talk, uh, I'm gonna thank these individuals, and then I'm gonna show you, I've got some video footage of a bunch of images from our summer sponge hunt. So, uh, I want to go ahead and thank the Department of Education MISEP grant, the Capital One grant for funding all of this. Uh, all my previous and current research students, the ones who are coming on board this summer, we are happy to have you. And I'm so incredibly thankful for my research leads that I've had over the years. My CSRO members who are always enthusiastic and ready to go, I could pick up the phone tomorrow and have a trail of them out the door ready to go hunt sponges with me. I'm so blessed. Uh, all my family members who have hunt, hunted sponges with me, my father, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, uh, my daughter, my husband. Now, he does not want to hunt sponges, but sometimes he'll pull a log out the water for me. <laughs> all the faculty at BRCC and the administration who have supported research at our institution, and of course, Curry for bringing freshwater sponges into our lives. So with that, I'm going to show you I think, yes, our little video. Mert, it's not showing. Is it showing? Can y'all see it? It's coming. Okay. It's thinking about it. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> Am I supposed to see it? <laughs> oh, there it is. That was cool, Mary. Thanks for sharing that. I think you might still be muted. Are you muted? Okay. Am I un I'm unmuting myself? <laughs> there you are. So now I guess I'll take any questions that anyone has. 
Oh, we got some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them one by one and we'll get to as many as we can. Okay. Uh, Becky from Connecticut has a really interesting question. So she wants to know where she could go to find sponges in Connecticut, if you know. In, and so Connecticut, uh, fresh water, turn over rocks, turn over rocks, pull. So um, we found, uh, so yeah, clear water up there get you a rake, a hoe, whatever, pull, turn over rocks, get, it, sometimes you have to get into the water. It, so not, not all the time are they going to be next to the shoreline, in other words. So streams, any riverbeds, uh, they do not like uh, anything that's heavily silted. So stay away from anything that's got a lot of silt or sand, because that tends to clog the osculums. So we don't, we don't find them in that environment, but if you find anything that's got a rocky environment, flip over some rocks. Cool. Tally's mm -hmm. asking, out of the 31 total uh, species, how many are actually native to Louisiana? So those, oh, native, well, those, the 31, those are the ones that have been documented in Louisiana, in, in the United States. In Louisiana, we've had 15. Did that answer her question? Hey, Tally. <laughs> <laughs> Tally actually had one that came just on the tail of the other one. Um, and she's asking, um, since sponges filter, do they actually produce waste? And if they do, does this benefit other species? Hmm, that's a good question. And I'm sure they produce some type of byproduct that hasn't been measured. It's not that I haven't measured it, but I'm sure they produce some type of byproduct. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that that, uh, I'm not sure if the toxicity, there are some sponges that are toxic, but I'm not sure if that's why they're toxic. Great. Sam wants to clarify that you actually saw two snakes in the snake pit. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Sam. <laughs> And See, I, wasn't, I wasn't as impacted by the snake. To me, I'm like, whatever. Look, it's just in the water. I know there are sponges down there. I don't care if they're snakes. And then Jeffrey made an interesting comment. Two oh, words, gosh. fish food flies. What is that uh, about? <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So we were out. We were out hunting. And... We went, oh, Ori, Ori, so Ori mapped out all of our adventures, and we drove down this road, for, for better words, and there were some rocks along the way, and I said, all right, Jeffrey, let's, let's, let's look there, and he goes down into this brush, and you hear the the noise of bugs this you know it sounds like flies and i'm over there screaming jeffrey get out of there <laughs> and, he comes up, and we've got flies all over us and we didn't put the two together we thought it was something in the environment but it was this type of fly that smells like fish food because we saw, we smelled them at another location too. <laughs> and, and there is a scientific name for them. I don't know what they are, but yeah, fish food flies. <laughs> that yes. was, that was a trip. Oh my gosh. And, and Jeffrey had fish food flies in his beard. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, luckily, no. luckily though, they didn't bite. So they weren't biting flies. Oh, but they smelled horrendous. It was <laughs> Fun, fun times on the fun, fun times on the sponge hunt. <laughs> Not an adventure until you have fish food flies, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Look, you're gonna smell them one day, and you're gonna think of me, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> Tori actually has a pretty serious question. So Tori is asking, um, 
If you have ever found any antibiotic resistant bacteria on freshwater sponges. Hey, Tori. No, I haven't. <laughs> but to be honest, we haven't really looked or studied that component of it. So most of the antibiotic producing organisms that we have found came from Lomcon. Perfect. Um, Todd had a, a comment that you could use the CREMS water data um, to find maybe some coastal areas for you to search. Okay. okay. Um, that's Cren a huge, huge data set. Very useful. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. I can send you the link if you want. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Aaron's question is, do different sponges prefer different substrates? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, we have found, uh, for instance, the Trochospongella ladii. Um, we've only found it on rocks and, and bricks. And uh, there's a lot of, do I have the book near me? This book. And then there's one that's the ecology of sponges and it tells you their preferred substrates. Um, Spongella uh, lacustris is very common in, in Louisiana. Uh, Ori and I termed it old trusty because if we didn't find it any, if we found, we didn't find any sponge, we found that one there. Uh, it, it is a very small, small sponge and it will, it, it can be found on any substrate. Very good. Arturo has a question about um, <clears throat> variations in color, and he was wondering if you could just speak to uh, that in more depth, variation in color. Sure, sure. So whenever the sponge filters, sometimes the components, the pollutants in the environment get stuck within the sponge. So for instance, E. fragilis, the, from the publications that I have read, most of the times e fragilis is either like a cream color or a, a green color but in louisiana we found it black and the reason that we're seeing it so black is because of the contaminants in the water systems so, in fact jeffrey was with me one time and he said he said oh my gosh is this a sponge and it was it was so contaminated and it was it was so thick and black. I was like, oh yeah, that sponge. It's just not healthy. Oh. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt the sponge. E. fragilis is very resilient in those types of environments. But then other types of sponge, if you were to put, say, um, T. ladii, which is very sensitive to pollutants, if you were to put it in that same environment, it would die. It 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 couldn't withstand that. Interesting. Thank you for that. Jonathan, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I'm sorry. Was that Jonathan's question? No, that was Arturo's question. Sorry about that. Jonathan's question is next. Um, and okay. he's wondering how much of a background in marine biology is required for sponge research? I don't have any background in marine biology. Just got to have that passion. <laughs> you do. You do. Look, I, I am all for, I, I am all for self-education. I, yeah, I, I attended workshops. I attended two training workshops. I, I reached out to experts in my field. At no time did I think I am an expert and I can learn this on my own. Uh, I was very dependent on the work of, of researchers before me, and that's how you that's how you learn and grow in your field. Uh, a lot of the tools that I had learned in uh, microbiology, uh, those are cross disciplinary PCR reaction, troubleshooting PCR, all that I learned working uh, in in microbiology. Uh, so. It, you learn these these skills and you can apply them to different areas. Yeah, the the trendy term for that is transferable skills. So yes. you can learn every, you know, you can learn anywhere and transfer, you know, those common skills to any application. So right. And right. 
in uh, mentorship is very important. You pick good mentors mm -hmm. and then you're yeah. set. Yes. Absolutely. Um, Christopher has a question about whether there's information as to how invasive species like the apple snails affect freshwater sponges. That is very interesting because we have made observations uh, and this was something that we are very interested in studying as, as a side project, uh, looking at the impact because areas in which we would think there would be sponges and there aren't sponges, there's a large amount of apple snails. So we are questioning, are the apple snails predators? Or are they secreting toxins that may cause these sponges to die off? Uh, because it is it is very um it's it's it is something that we we've, we've questioned. Matthew had made that comment. We were in the field the other day, and he's like, "Oh, there's apple snail. We're not going to find sponges here." <laughs> apple snails. I know. I know. Um, Aaron has a question about how quickly freshwater sponges colonize new substrates, and how quickly do they grow? So they are seasonal. So sponges are seasonal in that they, they have a, a heavy growth period and then they have a heavy uh, gemulation period. Um, unfortunately, what's in the literature is not, well, I say it's unfortunate, it's not really unfortunate. <laughs> uh, it, it conflicts with what we are seeing in Louisiana. Um, we are seeing uh, a late, uh, w for instance, E. fragilis. A lot of the lit literature says that E. fragilis grows the best in the fall, where we are seeing it very prevalent in the summer. Um, so it's it's very dependent uh, growth rate. There's a lot of different factors. If if the temperature is too high, it's going to grow slower. So it's it's very dependent. And then there are some sponges that won't get any larger than the tip of my pinky. And then there's some that will encrust an entire brick or rocks for, per se. So it really depends on the species that we're talking about. So I'm sorry, I don't have a concrete, concrete answer for that uh, because there are so many variables that impact it. Um, freshwater sponges uh, usually reproduce asexually, although there are some sexual reproduction uh, and budding. So you know, it just, just depends. Perfect. Um, Arturo has another question about um, processing sponges. And he, mm -hmm. he would like to know um, what's special about the gene that you amplify with your PCR? So if you, there's actually a sponge barcoding website. So if you go to a sponge barcoding website, um, it, it shows you the genes of interest and the cytochrome oxidase gene that's involved in metabolism. Uh, and there is variation between species of eukaryotic organisms. So if you were to go into the NCBI database and search cytochrome oxidase gene, a lot of eukaryotic organisms are, uh, are used, uh, they use that particular gene. Perfect. Um, we also have a clarifying statement from Dr. Archer. Okay. <laughs> and she would like to just put in sponges do poop. <laughs> a quote, a quote. <laughs> I haven't been pooped on, Stephanie. <laughs> Although I have been in many water systems that smell like poop, it could be the sponges. <laughs> there's a first time for fish food flies, so there's a first time uh, for sponges. <laughs> No, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, Rebecca would like to know that if during a sponge hunt, how do you di differentiate a sponge from moss or fungus? Asking for her mom. Ah, well, there there are different ways. Uh, one is texture. So for a, a lot of times, especially from a distance, uh, a sponge and algae look very, they, they could be uh, identical. Um, but if you feel it, <laughs> that hispid 
that the spicules that stick up, you can feel that. So sometimes it's all about touch. Excellent. Um, Tally actually has a comment for Jeff and she <laughs> says she was paying attention. <laughs> I love Sally and Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen has a question about where she might be able to find sponges in Gonzales. Oh, what what parish is that? Put me on the spot right now. Um, oh. I know we have surveyed that area. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look it up. I'll look it up. That's what they're Google for. Tell, tell her, tell her that she she's one of my students. That Kristen K Kane. Uh, Johnson. I look. Oh, Chris. That's my friend. <laughs> tell her, you, Kristen, if if you would come sponge hunting with me, you could see sponges. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> It is an it is an assumption. That's what I thought. Yes. So it's an tell, assumption. Tell I'm not, uh, Kristen, I'm not telling you where they are. You have to come with yeah. me. <laughs> oh, the gauntlet has been thrown down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have passed. So so when I go to her house and we go to the store or something, we'll be passing a creek, and I'll tell her I need to put my kayak in there to find sponges. So she needs to go back to that area, jump in the creek, and find the sponges for me. She knows where they're at. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephanie is a wealth of information. So Stephanie, you're out there paying attention. I am going to make you a panelist so that you can share your mic and your camera. Is that my girl, Archer? Yeah. So you should have just gotten an invitation to become a panelist. So if you didn't attend, uh, Stephanie Archer, uh, her, her main background is on marine sponges. And we have been working together uh, with freshwater sponges recently. So there she is. Hey, hey guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining in, Steph. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So we were talking about sponge poop. Would you like to elaborate? Sure. So um, I think it would be actually really interesting to figure out if freshwater sponges do do this. But um, marine sponges, especially ones that grow in the encrusting form, like freshwater sponges do, they actually um, they turn over their coanocytes um, really quickly. And that's actually largely what they poop out. Um, it's that plus the things that they can't eat. Um, and it's actually a really nutrient dense food. So things like amphipods and other little tiny creatures eat it. And it's actually um, on coral reefs, it's a really, really fast and really, really uh, efficient transfer of nutrients from the water column to these little amphipods that then fish eat. And so it's one hypothesis for why uh, although a lot of the life can exist in a really nutrient poor system like coral reefs. So that's, that's the fun facts about sponge poop. And there's actually a really fun, there's a really fun video that I've been looking, huh? I want you to work on that. <laughs> I'd love that's to. A research question. <laughs> Maybe we can get Matthew to work on that in the fall. Matthew, are you up for that, Matthew? <laughs> That's great. I know, I know what Matthew will say. He'll say, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> All right, we have, uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find a question from somebody who hasn't asked one yet. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ooh, here's one, here's one from Becky. Becky is asking, how big do the spicules get? Can you see any with the naked eye? Are saltwater are saltwater ones bigger than or smaller than freshwater? The spicules. So spicule size varies between sponge species. There are the megascolares, the microscolares, and the gymnoscolares. 
Uh, the megasclares are the ones that support the sponge body and those are the largest. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you, you usually have to have some type of magnification, but usually the cell phone, if you were to look at it real close with your cell phone, you can see the megasclares depending on the species. I would say that marine sponges have tiny ones too, but marine sponges definitely can have bigger spicules than freshwater sponges because there's actually deep sea sponges, the stocked sponges, and their spicules can be huge. I, not, <laughs> you know, can be um, a couple feet in length. And so those are, are much bigger than anything we'd see in freshwater. Yeah. That's awesome. And then Dr. Archer, you went sponge hunting. Did you enjoy yourself? I did very much so. I've gone <laughs> twice with Mary now. Yeah. Awesome. We were supposed to go again on Tuesday, but I'm thinking Cristobal has different plans for that. But... Different plans for all of us all around. It's very different <laughs> from Marines and sponge hunting, right? <laughs> yes and no. I mean, you're less you're not necessarily uh, as submerged in marine sponge hunting, but you still have the same things. Species mm -hmm. that you're looking for in a site where you think they'd be everywhere, they're not, mm -hmm. and vice versa. OK, you two, since we've already descended into chaos, <laughs> um, there are some very interesting uh, comments, feedback. <laughs> coming through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the Lumcon Science Talk after party. Oh, <laughs> and okay. I'm going to I'm going to open the mics since we have two amazing sponge scientists on the same screen in the same space right now. Um, I'm just going to open the audience mics. Uh, so for any audience members who want to help me thank Dr. Miller for her amazing talk and share wonderful sponge knowledge with these two excellent women in science, um, feel free to do so. So if you're ready to log off, don't forget to register for next week's talk. Um, the registration for that will go up on the website by tomorrow morning. The recording for this talk will go up by tomorrow morning as well. So if you have friends and family who had to miss it for some reason, they can watch it in their own time. So. For that, this is the official end of this Thursday Science Talk. If you just want to hang out with us for a few more minutes and uh, chit chat, we'll be opening mics momentarily. <laughs> All right, you guys, mics are able to be unmuted on your end now. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to open your mic. Don't all Nobody's do it. <laughs> now they're going to be silent. <laughs> hey, Stephanie, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, we can hear okay. you. So, um, and by the way, this is Christina. I'm actually one of the, um, uh, I'm working under Dr. Uh, Mary Miller this, uh, this summer. Um, but I had a question uh, for Stephanie. Um, I was wondering if there are any saltwater sponges near Louisiana. Um, I don't know how, I don't know where the boundaries are for the salt water. So I wasn't sure if there was anything close to there. Yeah, um, I'm still learning. I'm relatively new to Louisiana. I moved down here in November, but um, there are freshwater or marine sponges in Louisiana. Um, right before we got shut down with COVID actually, um, Craig's group, our executive director, they go out sampling in Terrebonne Bay uh, monthly, I think, and they brought me an oyster shell that had a boring sponge that had infested the whole oyster cells. So boring sponges are ones that actually you produce chemicals to erode calcium carbonate structures. And so this oyster shell had um, a, a sponge living all throughout it, and you could see little orange polyps everywhere. Um, so those cleonids are definitely in our marshes and um, on oysters and mussels and things like that. Uh, there's also some helichondria species that I've seen records of. And then after that, you have to get a little bit further out. Um, out, Like Mary said, marine sponges are no different than freshwater sponges. They don't like a lot of mud and silt. So you have to get a little bit further out, 
other than that, I think. But yeah. Hi, this is Jonathan. I'm one of Dr. Miller's summer interns, and I had a question about. Um, I remember Dr. Miller, you you were saying that you could have researched the bacteria inside of the sponges, but then you were interested in the sponges. Is there any research that can be done about the bacteria in sponges or, you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We, we've started exploring projects to look at um, the different uh, microbial communities within the sponges. Uh, there has been research that's been done out there already. Uh, so we're looking at ways to uh, kind of build on that. So you can one, definitely, of the, one of the one thing that you can do is called next generation sequencing and next generation sequencing will give you a community profile of those organisms. I was just going to add that I think one of the coolest things about sponges is how tightly they form associations with the microbiome, um, both bacteria and archaea, and how diverse the bacterial communities are within sponges. So mm -hmm. there's all sorts of questions there. For all of you young scientists out there, mm -hmm. lots and lots of questions. Can I speak? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. This is Jim Hewitt. Hey, how are you? Yay! That's my buddy <laughs> <in> Rochester. <laughs> Yay, you, thank you so much for talking. Yeah, what? you killed it. You totally ah. crushed it. Ah, I love <laughs> having support from my Curry family. <laughs> Yeah, Every time so, I post something on Facebook, I tell him he's the reason. Uh, I mean, I just, I just love my Curry family. I just love them. Yeah, it was. Um, it's amazing to watch that presentation about how you built that in that state because you may have covered that state more than any other state in the in the U.S. There's nobody else that has done that. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> And yeah, uh, I'm sure well again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sure there's plenty of our curry uh, people who are on this. They must have been watching this because we put this out. We push it out on the Facebook page. And um, but you are you are now the superhero. You are the you are the sponge whisperer. So <laughs> we're proud of you. I, can I get a sticker? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need a cape. Not a sticker. We'll send you another. We can send you another lanyard. We'll get you some lanyards that just. I mean, we are. We talk about you. <laughs> I can bring Mary a cape the next time we go. Yeah, but, but yeah, look, there it is. Look, yeah. Look, look, there look, it there. is. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. We're so, we're so very proud. And uh, it was so cool. You crushed it. You totally crushed it. So. Hi, Mary. This is Joy. Hey, Joy. You did an awesome job. And if they don't watch out, you will whisper uh, sponges all over the U.S. Because when we went to Washington, Mary turned over everything to look for a sponge. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, Joy, I got to look under that rock. So, <laughs> there's like a little pond. Up to there are ducks there. Behind duck poop, there are sponges. So, so we got those limbs now. Awesome. Awesome. Hey Mary, it's Brenda. Hey Brenda. So that's my Hi. Tulsa friend. <laughs> that's my Tulsa sponge hunter. Who will not go hunting so I, right now because she's scared of snakes. Yeah, I have a snake issue. <laughs> Makes it tough. That's why I stay up in the winter. So Beans I have a question. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um do you guys have much of a zebra mussel issue down in Louisiana? I, I don't. I don't think so. Mm, okay. Not like not like they do further north in the Mississippi, in the Great Lakes. Okay. Okay. Well, because we we have them here in some some of our lakes are just are really just you know full of them. It it's it's pretty bad in certain areas, and 
we are not finding sponges where we're having the really big populations of zebra mussels. And I've looked in the literature and seen um, mixed studies. Some say, oh, they think that that does decrease them. And others are saying they think it increases. So I was just going to see if you guys had any there to, to as a comparison. I don't think we, I mean, again, I'm <laughs> there, there's, there's not in the numbers that you see further north. Well, based upon Google, Mary, it says <laughs> that in the summer, the uh -huh. river levels decrease and the river temperature becomes very high and it stresses the zebra mussels. So that's a little known problem in Louisiana. Hope that helps. Oh, okay. So it might be too hot. Yeah, um, so Rob, who would know, says that um, it's too hot here, that we typically get them in the winter, but they die out in the summer. Cool. So thanks for that, Rob. Cool. Hello out there. Hello. Hi, Ms. Merck, Dr. Miller, <laughs> Dr. Archer. Is that uh, Ross? This is Ross D. said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, we're Dad, having a good time, and Dad uh, Dad's with me. Yeah, we, we haven't missed a single one there. We bond over this. <laughs> and Dad would like to have a question with me, and we're thinking about which one, Dr. Miller, Dr. Archer, are your favorite sponges, whether it's freshwater or saltwater? Well, I don't know any saltwater, so I have to say my freshwater. <laughs> <laughs> I I like I. I I like the morphology of the Troco spongella latii. I like the biro tools. I think they're they're just super cool to look at look at under the SEM. But then we have to appreciate the E fragilis because that one's taken one for the team. I mean, it's so abundant in Louisiana because of all the pollution. Yes, ma'am. I have two. Uh, no. Can I do that? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> The one is a, a tropical shallow water species, um, Ursinia felix, and its common name is the stink sponge. I told Mary about this last time we were out. Uh, it smells like sulfur and garlic when you take it out of the water. It's awful. Uh, it's kind of an ugly sponge. It's gray, um, but it does such cool things. Um, it has really really, really diverse and dense microbial community, um, symbiotic microbial community. And it can, uh, every step of the nitrogen cycle can happen within that sponge, which is insane. Um, it can control parts of its tissue to make it um, anoxic or oxic. It's a really cool uh, holobiont, I guess. It's cool with its microbes. Ooh. And then, my other favorite sponge is one that I learned about actually when I started my postdoc in Canada, Aphrocalistes vastus. So it's a deep water glass sponge, and it's one of the ones that forms the sponge reefs up in Canada. And up until I think I talked about it, but now I'm blanking on the year 2018, I think it was, the, the, um, the people found the really, really, really big sponge off of Hawaii. The largest known sponge was an Aphrocalistes vastus at over a meter long and a half meter wide so pretty big um and they form reefs that are over nine thousand years old which is pretty cool too that's polluted well that's wow. that's awesome well dr miller uh you know you knocked it out of the park uh miss mert you sure you sure have your hands full every weekend <laughs> thank you for coming on and uh, keeping uh, dr miller uh in checking out but uh it's it's been a pleasure and i'm glad we uh we got to see everybody and everyone you know the what do you call that the, well uh, the favorite oh the dr miller fan club is alive and well <laughs> and getting bigger all the time apparently <laughs> yes ma'am ross is so great to hear a voice thank you so much yes likewise Ms. Ross. yes ma'am <laughs> i have one more question for dr archer um what have you learned from seeing 
freshwater sponges that has helped you when you study no um i think salt water is it, salt water is other type of sponge yes so what have you learned from studying freshwater sponges that has been transferable in the other species other type of sponges that is a good question so i'm pretty new to freshwater sponges i started studying them uh when i got here and i met mary and mike um and so and since that time i actually haven't gotten to work with marine sponges very much so it's a hard hard question to answer but um i think more than anything else it's an appreciation for exactly what the the small encrusting guys can do because most of the sponges i worked with in the marine environment um were the big guys the guys that form the big fancy structures um and it's real even for a group of taxa that's easily overlooked like sponges it's even easy within a, a as a sponge biologist to focus on the big guys and um so learning from freshwater sponges to uh, appreciate and pay attention to the the small encrusting ones, even if they look like snot. Okay, well, I want to say thank you to Dr. Miller and Dr. Archer, and thank you, Dr. Mert, for, for organizing this. And um, it, it turned out well, just like all the previous ones. Oh, thank you. And just so you know, I'm not as amazing as these women, so I'm not a doctor. I'm just Miss Mert. That does me not amazing. <laughs> I'm the idiot that does the intros that don't. <laughs> nope. We both disagree with you on that. <laughs> uh, I'm okay with it. Um, we're getting some interesting questions about whether you plan on starting like a volunteer um, opportunity for people to come out and hunt with you that aren't students. So um, sponge haunting is, is very unique in that um, you could go 10 places and not find a sponge. Uh, so it's, it's kind of difficult to take volunteers along because if there's, there is that level of disappointment. Um, now, Dr. Archer and myself, we are working on developing a community outreach. So we're hoping that we can build those types of structures. That would be so awesome. Yeah, because we definitely want to share uh, sponges and you know what a sponge looks like, how how to I uh, you know um, you can't identify a sponge by looking at it, but you know understand the parts of the sponge. And, and work through those components. Uh, so we are looking at ways that we can involve the community. Yeah, I think uh, the two of you right now are uh, are making a really good start on that. You're and you I'm about to have to jet on and... out. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to like, jet on out. I got to go take care of my pup. <laughs> accolades are still coming in. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you so much for joining the after party. Uh, we, I know I really do apologize. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, but thank you, Stephanie. Oh, no problem. Thanks for letting me join in and talk about sponges more. It's <laughs> any any day, Stephanie. Any topic. <laughs> thank you, Mert. I gotta get out, but I appreciate it. I thank you again for for letting us present all that we have done, and uh, we'll, we'll just keep on working. You and your students are doing incredible work, Mary. Thank you. So thank good you. for you. Thank you so much for that. Well, y'all take care. I'm gonna try and log myself out. <laughs> I will. I will do it for you. It'll automatically happen for you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Mary. Bye, Stephanie. <laughs> Bye, Mary. Bye. Bye, Bye Joy. Bye. Bye.